Hello and welcome to Q&A. I'm Jay Nordlinger and this podcast is brought to you by Zip Recruiter and Dollar Shave Club. I'll have more to say about those excellent companies later in the show. Our guest is Ben Shapiro, the writer, lawyer, podcaster, speaker, lots of things. He is the founder and editor-in-chief of The Daily Wire, a news and opinion site. And Ben, I have to ask you, there was a very popular TV program, The Wire. Did that relate to the naming, <laughs> did, did that relate to the naming of your site at all? No, but I wish our site were as good as that show. Well. So it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, no, it, it, it's just uh, a throwback to, you know, the idea of getting news off the wire. I love that. Love it. I'm kind of a throwback myself, Ben. Um, <clears throat> so you spoke at Berkeley recently, and there was a big to do. It was ultimately a great success, I think. And I understand that beforehand, this is hard to believe. You tell me whether it's true or false, you know, fake news or real. Is it true that the university offered counseling to students before your arrival in case they were traumatized by the idea of your showing up and speaking? That can't be true, can it? No, that's real. They, they, sent a, they sent a full letter to everyone in the administration and the student body offering counseling services to not just students, but also administrators, if anything that I said upset people. Now, I am pretty well assured that is not something they send before every speaker, but um, they did send it for me, which is, I think, demonstrative of, of the weakness of the administration and also what exactly they're teaching kids that, that's providing the gas in the tank for these anti-free speech attacks. Yeah. Now, speaking of these attacks, Ben, the, the, the violent types, the, the, the worst protesters or disruptors, are they university people or do they come from the broader leftist Oakland community? I've heard conflicting things. Do you have a sense of this? Yeah, I mean, what I've heard from the police, and I believe I have no reason not to believe the police, is that they're coming from the outside community. The vast majority of Antifa are not students at the university. There may be a couple. There may be a few. But the vast majority are coming from outside groups and, and agitating. And the way that they operate is that they infiltrate large crowds of students without a mask. And then they'll jump out, put on a mask, throw something at the cops, fade back in, into the crowd, and, uh, and then disappear. And that, that's sort of the tactic they like to use. So it's, uh, I think Antifa is, uh, is still a relatively small group, but uh, they take advantage of bigger crowds in order to, in order to look like they, they have bigger numbers. Mm. Um, ben, w when you were there, uh, did you have a sense that there was violence in the air or that something really unpleasant was a possibility or was it relatively calm? No, I, I think that if the cops hadn't been there, then it definitely would have gotten violent. I mean, there were nine people arrested uh, as is, so it wasn't <sighs> like, it wasn't like there was nothing that happened. It was, there were, there were four people arrested for carrying weapons. There was somebody arrested for spitting on the police. Um, there, you know, I, I think that and this is what the police told me, too. They said, if it, this is the first event in years where they've been told, do what you have to do to tamp down the violence. If somebody acts violently, arrest them. If somebody puts on a mask, arrest them. And being given that sort of power and also being told to show up on mass, that meant this is the first time in a long time the Berkeley police have actually felt that they had the capacity to do what they need to do. Uh, ben, being there as the center of attention, um, was it sort of exciting or was it more disturbing? Do you know what I mean by that? Or was it some combination? Yeah. I mean, it was definitely a combination. It's always exciting when you know that a lot of people are watching what you're going to say. And the left brought a lot of attention to what I was going to say. So I thought that was important and, and good, yeah. but, uh, you know, inadvertent on their part. But as far as, you know, being, you know, I think it was confusing. Uh, I, I don't know why they have to spend $600,000 to the little me is that I can get out there and talk. <laughs> it doesn't seem like uh, something that, that ought to be necessary in the United States. Uh, and also, the, there, you know, uh, sorry, sorry, ben, real. sorry, Ben, did you say $600,000? Yeah, that's what they Over spent, on, spent on security. Yep. God, what that an honor. They, spent on security. they should have mailed it to you directly. I mean, deposited into your uh, account. Hey, I'd be, I'd be fine <laughs> with that. I mean, as I said, I, I did say in my speech to, to all these people on the left, you know, you're, you're on the left and you're complaining about how much money you just got spent on security. Put on your leftist hat and thank me for how many jobs I just created. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are listening to Ben, ben Shapiro. I sometimes think of him as uh, Ben Shap. And um, I'm Jay Nordlinger of Q&A, and we'll be back after this word from a sponsor. By now, you probably know that Dollar Shave Club ships amazing razors for a few bucks. I've been a member for a while, and I love my shave. 
What you might not know, I didn't, is that Dollar Shave Club has products for pretty much everything else you need in the bathroom. Body wash, shampoo, hair gel, lip balm, etc. This other stuff makes Dollar Shave Club all the sweeter. At the store, there are many, many options, and you sometimes can't tell the difference between them. Then, if you have questions, the clerk, if you can find one, usually doesn't know the difference either. They know as little as the customer. DSC makes it easy and convenient for you to upgrade your shave and your bathroom. Now you don't have to set foot in a store to get a high-quality shave and grooming products. Dollar Shave Club will deliver them right to your door. Like their razors, everything is super high quality and has left me mighty impressed. From premium ingredients to sophisticated scents, DSC is changing the game. If you're tired of nonsense at the store, now's the time to try out Dollar Shave Club. For a limited time, DSC is basically giving away their starter set to new members. For only $5, this set features their executive razor and three trial size versions of their most popular products. These help you stay fresh and clean. In your first box, you will receive their shave butter, body wash, and one wipe Charlie's. You will also receive their executive razor which includes their premium weighty handle and full cassette of cartridges. After the first box, replacement cartridges are sent for only a few bucks a month. This offer is exclusively available at, and here's the web address, dollarshaveclub.com slash QA. That's for this podcast, Q&A, of course. Here's that address again dollarshaveclub.com slash QA. Dollar Shave Club's high-quality products will have you covered from head to toe and smelling sweet. There is no better time to try the club. I'm Jay Nordlinger with Q&A. Privileged to be talking today with the famous, infamous, wonderful, and consequential Ben Shapiro. Uh, ben, um, I did. I did just a little bit of writing about Berkeley, and um, I heard from some students, from some alumni, really, as, as one often does, saying, "Look, I was conservative. I had a great experience there. Had a wonderful education. The administration was friendly. It wasn't so bad." And then I also hear these horror stories, and I'm sure all of it's true. I, I, I'm the type to believe the horror stories, and I sometimes think that college campuses are just, um, you know, they're all dominated by Melissa Click. I think that was her name, uh, that, that, that <laughs> yeah. zoo. So, but, but sometimes the reports are confusing and contradictory. I suppose it depends on uh, what you study, who your friends are, uh, whether you're sort of out and proud or more. Do you know what I mean, Ben? It, it, it's hard yeah, to get a yeah, handle on the thing. I want to be realistic, yeah. but I don't want to be a right-wing paranoiac, and I've spent a great deal of my life as a right-wing paranoiac, justifiably. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that it does differ based on experience. I went to UCLA. I went to Harvard Law School, both very left, obviously, and I had a good time at both. I really enjoyed it, but you have to use your head. I think that, that you have to determine which professors are willing to hear a countervailing point of view and which administrators are going to be friendly and then work within those confines. So I think that it is true that conservative students are mistreated and and put down. But I also think that it's true that not only can you sort of thrive in that environment if you go in knowing the limitations, but also knowing the opportunities, because you do get the opportunity to test your ideas against the left's ideas, and I think that's a valuable thing. So um, I'm not somebody who's ever said that if you have a kid, you should only send your kid to a conservative school. I've always said that if your kid can take it, it's good to send them to a non-conservative school so they can test their ideas and and, and strengthen their convictions. But if the kid has no conviction, then obviously bias is going to have some impact. Well, you anticipated a question of mine. Uh, I believe you have children who are very young. Um, mm-hmm. So they're a yeah, long way off four. from... Beg your pardon? Two under four, yeah. Ha, huh, right. So, so they're, a, they're a long way off from their, their freshman year. Um, uh, they're, they're approaching kindergarten. Um, uh, but... I, I'm asked by so many parents, I'm not sure what to do with my children. 
I mean, we can't all go to Hillsdale, right? Is it safe to send them to a place like Berkeley? Will they turn into zombies? Will they come home with Che Guevara t-shirts? Will they be beaten up? What will happen? I'm sure you're approached by and written uh, to by, um, by many parents, I'm guessing. Um, do you have an answer to this? Yeah, and the, the answer that I usually give is you, it really does it really does depend on the kid. Um, you know, if, if the kid is strong in their values and is seeking to strengthen their capacity to argue, sending them to a, a left place is not a terrible idea. It also depends on what they want to major in. If they're majoring in sciences, I'm not sure it ma- matters a great deal whether they are left or right, because if you're you know, an engineering major, I, I don't think it has too much of an impact in the classroom. Um, if, however, your kid is not fully formed ideologically, if your kid is um, you know, do- doesn't have strong ideas about values, then you should understand that whatever environment you put your kid into is going to have a pretty significant impact on your kid. So if you put your kid at Hillsdale, then your kid is likely to come out much more conservative. If, your kid, if you put your kid at Berkeley, your kid's likely to, be come out, to come out much more to the left. You know, that's putting aside ancillary issues like how the administration you know, treats free speech and, and sexual assault. And, and these are obviously controversial issues in and of themselves. But it just in terms of the ideological impact, you, you really do have to gauge it based on who your child is and, and tailor it to that. Ben, do you think there's something weird or something toxic about Berkeley? Is it different from UCLA, or do you think Berkeley is fairly representative of our our leading universities? Well, I think in terms of ideological breakdown, it's pretty representative. I think in terms of violence, it's not. So, mm. yeah, you know, I, I went to UCLA. UCLA is just as left as Berkeley. Um, that's yeah. I, I don't think that's really even controversial. It's just that at Berkeley. Everything is exaggerated, and, and Antifa has made things much worse. I mean, I spoke at Berkeley a year and a half ago, and it cost zero money for security. I had my, mm. I had my two security guards. There were no protesters, no problem. In the last year and a half over there, it's become very bad, but that's not, it's not just Berkeley. I mean, at Cal, State, uh, at Cal State Los Angeles, I spoke there in February 2016. Right before I spoke at Berkeley in Cal State LA, they basically had a riot. So it, it depends Jeez. on the campus. It depends on the timing. It's, it's, it's pretty wild. Uh, I would say I speak on 25 to 30 college campuses a year, and anywhere from 5 to 10, uh, things get dicey in some way. Some of them you know, really get dicey, like, like Cal State LA or like Berkeley. Uh, some of them, the administrators are insane, like DePaul. Um, and most of them, it just goes fine. I come in, I speak, no problem. Mm. Uh, ben, I understand there's going to be a, a, some kind of free speech week at Berkeley with Milo and those guys. Are, are you part of that? Um, so I am not part of that. I would not be part of that because I object to Milo on a deep moral level. Um, I, I think Milo is a, a scourge to the movement. I think he's, he's awful for conservatism, and I don't think he's a good person. So uh, I think that Charles Murray's very colorful description of Milo is yes. mine as well. So, that, so um, I have no interest in engaging there. I, I actually, um, you know, look, I, I think Milo, like everyone else, has a has First Amendment right to speak where he's invited uh, in places like Berkeley. Uh, that said, I do get the feeling that there is something of a, a bit of a scam going on from what I'm hearing from people on the ground at Berkeley. The scam being that Milo and crew have not jumped through any of the hoops that we jumped through. We worked with the administration for months in advance of the event, and a lot of those requirements were very burdensome, I think needlessly so. But apparently the folks working with, with the Free Speech Week have not done like the most elementary preparation because they're hoping that, number one, it gets shut down and they can blame Berkeley, or number two, that they go and it gets violent, and then they can and then they can be the victim. So, um, my feeling is that you shouldn't have to manufacture victimhood at the hands of, of groups like Antifa. Antifa will do it all on its own. Yeah, and you know when it comes to these provocateurs, I mean people who are one hundred percent provocateurs. I think of a phrase from the nineteen sixties: benign neglect. Sometimes that's the the best approach. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, talking with Ben Shapiro. I'm Jay Nordlinger. Back in a moment after this word from a sponsor. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click. Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you, it finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. 
Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, listeners to Q&A can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash free trial. Hear it again, ZipRecruiter.com slash free trial and happy hiring. We're listening to Ben Shapiro, founder and editor-in-chief of The Daily Wire, and I'm Jay Nordlinger with Q&A. Uh, I'll give you kind of a funny memory, Ben. Uh, I was talking with, interviewing Thomas Sowell once, and I said something like this. I said, who has treated you worse in your life, fellow black people or white liberals? And he said, he gave that wonderful deep chuckle and said, too close to call. And, and I, I'm, I'm thinking how odd it must be to be Ben Shapiro, because on one hand, by the left, you're called a dastardly right-wing white supremacist. And from some on the right, you're damned for not being um, a white supremacist. Uh, how weird. Uh, you're damned on the left, damned on the right. I guess, you know, as with Thomas Sowell, I have to ask you, uh, who has treated you worse or is it too close to call? Uh, well, I mean, I, I would say in the last year and a half, the uh, it, it is too close to call overall. I was in the last year, and I would, if you'd asked me six months ago, I would have said that the alt right treated me the worst. If you ask me now, I would say the hard left is treating me worse, but it, it does vary by day and by week. And do, you, do, you, do you feel sort of like? And, are you a pinata, Ben? I mean, it just must be so weird being you. But of course, you have it, it is weird. Hundreds I mean, of thousands I've said of fans. In my speeches. Yeah, I mean, I've said in my speeches, it's like I, I'm not I'm not a victim. Thank God, I, I lead a really happy life. Um, you know, I have a wonderful wife and two kids, and I live in a nice house, and, and I, I have a job that I really enjoy, and I get to talk to people all the time. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Um, but as far as the last year, I mean, I've been condemned as KKK by Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter by literally the KKK. So it's been a very weird year. Um, but I feel like that's where a lot of reasonable people have ended up, is being condemned by the, the nutcases on both sides. And I think that the, if the last year and a half hasn't brought the insanity out in American politics, I don't know what, what would. Yeah. Well, uh, Ben, let me throw this at you. I, um, I jotted a tweet about you the other day, and I said that you were, you know, wonderful, intelligent, blah, 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 and cheerful. And I got lots of messages from, from Ben Shapiro fans saying, cheerful? What are you talking about, Ben? <laughs> and I thought, I said, it's, listen, it's hard, it's hard to find a photo of Ben Shapiro on the Internet that is unsmiling. Uh, almost every photo I see of you has this this almost look of glee and relish on your face. I regard you as, I regard you as cheerful. Do you regard yourself as cheerful? Yeah, I mean, I do. I think that's, that's a dirty little secret uh, is that I actually really enjoy what I do and I enjoy life and I enjoy politics. And I, I think a lot of this is fun. So it's, it, it is weird. I, I think that because I am so hard charging in my language, uh, because I'm very strong in my language, uh, people tend to assume that it's because I'm cynical and miserable, uh, and that is very far from the case. And and I think that it's it's easier to caricature uh, people on the right as as misanthropes than to acknowledge that they might actually be having a good time just engaging. Listen, it's hard for me to think of you unsmiling. Um, <clears throat> here at the end, our producer Scott Immergut was telling me that that you've been involved very very recently in the last day or so in some kind of clash. Uh, with the comedian Jimmy Kimmel and and, and health care. Uh, do you care to say something about that, Ben, before we close here? Sure. I mean, I, I wouldn't really characterize it as a clash because I'm not sure that he's aware of my existence. But I think that, <laughs> um, but I think that uh, the, the, the basic conflict was that Jimmy Kimmel uh, has been promoting this, this thing about, you know, Obamacare being the, the greatest thing in the world and socialized medicine being the way to go. And he's been using the experience that he had with his, with his baby son, this, this terrible experience where his baby son had a congenital heart defect and had surgery at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and he's been using that as sort of the leverage point to push his political point of view. And I've been writing about this for a couple of months. I wrote about a piece about it today where I said this is, this is really, I, I think, wildly inappropriate, and I think we should not base public policy on personal experience like this. And I have a little bit of credibility to say that because my daughter had a, an ASD, an atrial septal defect, in her heart. She was operated on by exactly the same surgeon as Kimmel's kid at the exact same hospital, and my wife has worked at that hospital because she's a doctor. So, like, I know a little bit about that hospital, and I know a little bit about what it feels like to go through that, um, and that does not make expertise. Like, this, this bizarre notion in American life now that experience 
of, of tragedy makes you an expert on the underlying issue, it, it, it's utterly insane. I mean, it's like saying that being a victim of terrorism suddenly makes you an expert on Iranian foreign policy. Right? Mm. Why? I, I just don't, un- I don't understand what, what one has to do with the other, but we're, we're a feelings-based society now, so we all have to sort of grant higher levels of moral credibility to people who have suffered, uh, even if they don't have higher levels of knowledge. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have been listening to Ben Shapiro. He is, as far as I'm concerned, an, an MVP He has a lot of nerve, the right kind of nerve, and strength to your hands, Ben. Hey, thanks so much. I appreciate it. So long, everybody. Till next time. Join the conversation. Join the conversation. Join the conversation. Join the conversation. Join the conversation.